to address the audience. Distinguished participants of the plenary session, ladies, gentlemen, from the outset, I would like to thank you for coming to Russia and for taking part in the events organized by the Valdai Club. As is tradition, during these meetings, you raise acute burning issues of today. We and you discuss comprehensively issues that are relevant to people across all countries of the world. This year, the forum's main topic, uh, main theme has been formulated very straightforward, bluntly even, global shakeup, 2021, the individual values and the state. Indeed, we live in the time of fundamental shifts. And as is traditionally, if you permit me, I will speak and share my views on the agenda that you have formulated. This words live during the times of change. It seems somewhat trivial because we cite it so often, but this era goes back quite some time, and this state of fluidity has become something customary. So do we need to emphasize that or not? And I think that I agree with those who've come up with this agenda for this year's forum. I think it's worth doing that. Over the recent decades, many people have quoted the Chinese proverb, the Chinese people is very wise. They have great thinkers and great valuable thoughts we have to keep in mind. And one of them is, God forbid, that we should live in the time of change. And we live during these times of change, whether we want that or not. And these changes are becoming increasingly fundamental, increasingly tectonic. And let's cite another thing coming to us from China, another piece of wisdom. The word crisis in Chinese, I think there are many people from China here, and if I'm wrong, they will correct me, but as far as I understand, crisis in Chinese consists of two hieroglyphics. Uh, the one stands for danger and the other for opportunity. And we say in Russia, you've got to be clever about fighting the difficulties, and when you fight the danger, you've got to use your experience. And we have to realize the danger that we are up against, and we have to oppose it. And there are different dangers, and they are multifaceted. And there is another component to the crisis, namely opportunities, opportunities that are not to be missed, that have to be seized, especially because this crisis we are up against is of a conceptual nature, of civilizational nature. It is a crisis of approaches, of principles that underlie the very existence of humanity on Earth. And one way or another, we will have to have a very serious think about all of that. And we need to understand what we have to renounce, what we have to revisit, what we have to adjust. And I'm confident that genuine values have to be fought for, and we've got to defend them with everything we've got. Humanity has entered into a new era, and it happened more than three decades ago when the main conditions were in place to put an end to the military, political, and the ideological confrontation. I think you've talked about that, and our foreign minister spoke about these themes too, but some things I will have to reiterate. Back then, a search, a quest was started for a new balance, a new equilibrium, new conditions in social, political, economic, cultural, and military fields. There was a search for a foundation for a new world system. So far, we failed to grasp it. And those who felt that they were victors after the Cold War, and we said that on many, on many occasions, and they felt after climbing the Olympus that they were losing the feet, uh, the, the ground under their feet. And however beautiful the moment was, even you, you say, linger on, the art so fair, you cannot make it stop and linger. And this changeability is ever present, this transit is never ceasing, and it seems we should have adapted to it, but so far we failed to do that. And this transformation that we see is of a different magnitude than the ones humanity faced in the past. It's not just a shift and the balance of power or scientific and technological breakthrough, even though these things are happening right now. What we encounter right now is systemic changes that go in parallel 
in all directions, in all dimensions. The geological, the geophysical state of our planet is changing, and we have increasingly paradoxical interpretations of humanity is and what its raison d'etre is. Let's have a look around. Let me share some thoughts with you, thoughts that I cherish. First, the defamation, the degradation of climate and the environment are so evident that even the most careless people and laymen cannot simply dismiss them. We could have scientific discussions about the mechanisms behind these processes, but we see that these processes are deteriorating and something has to be done about it. Natural catastrophes such as droughts, floods, hurricanes and tsunami have become all but a norm. Suffice it to remember the tragic, devastating floods in Europe this summer or the wildfires in Siberia, but elsewhere too. We, we saw the wildfires in Turkey, in the US, and in the American continent, continent. Any geopolitical, any scientific, technological, and ideological competition becomes almost senseless amid such conditions. If the victor of such a competition will have nothing to breathe or nothing to sate their thirst, the coronavirus pandemic has become yet another reminder of how fragile our community is, how vulnerable it is. The main objective is to ensure safety and security of man and its stress resilience. In order to have greater chances of surviving the catastrophes, we need to revisit how we organize our life, our housing, how cities have to develop, what the objectives, what the priorities of economic development are for whole countries. and. Security is one of the imperatives, one of the peremptory norms, and uh, I dare anyone try to contest that. And then they will have to explain why they turned out to be not ready for crises and shakeups. Secondly, social and economic problems humanity is facing have exacerbated to an extent that. Right now, we see terrible consequences, and right now, everyone says that the current capitalism model, which underlies uh, social structure in the overwhelming majority of countries, has run its course, and there is no escaping the entanglement of controversies within the current model. Even in the richest countries and regions, we see an growing inequality of material benefits and also inequality of opportunities within societies and at the international level too. I spoke about this most important challenge when I spoke at the Davos Forum earlier this year. And of course, all of these issues are fraught with deep social rifts in a number of countries and a number of regions. People are facing a crisis of food. We'll probably get back to that. But there are grounds to believe that this crisis is only going to exacerbate, and it can take extreme forms. There is also the lack of potable water and electricity, and I think we'll get back to that as well, let alone such issues as poverty, high level of unemployment, as well as lack of proper health care. And countries that are lagging behind realize these issues very acutely, they despair of having a chance to catch up to the leaders. And this frustration is fueling aggression, pushing them into the ranks of extremists and people who live in these countries feel frustration because their expectations have been disappointed. They feel that they have no prospects, not themselves, not, not just themselves, but also their children. And this leads to a quest for a better life for uncontrolled migration, which in turn creates conditions for social discontent in countries and better off countries. I don't need to explain anything to you because you understand that and you probably know all of that better than I do. And also there are other acute social issues, challenges and risks in better off countries and leading countries. And right now, this fight for influence is uh, 
being relegated to the background because you've got to address your own problems first. And sometimes we see this bland, aggressive reaction of society, especially young people, against the measures aimed at coronavirus. And we see that the infection has become but a trigger, whereas the roots of social discontent run far deeper. The pandemic of coronavirus was supposed to consolidate people in the fight against this great threat of uh, the utmost magnitude, but instead it became a divisive factor. There are many reasons to explain that, but the most important issue is that people tend to traditional models which do not work, or to be more precise, they work, but very often they produce the obverse effect. Sometimes they lead to a worsening of the situation instead of improving it. On many occasions, Russia has come up with a call to put aside the ambitions that there is no place for in this world and to work together. I believe we'll talk about that later. Let's have a talk about the fight against the coronavirus pandemic. Well, I'm not talking about the sanctions against Russia, but you know that sanctions persist even against countries that are in dire need of international aid, and these sanctions are still there. These restrictive measures are still in place, and what about principles of humanism that underline the Western political thought? In reality, it turns out to be nothing but blah, blah. Well, that's what we see. When we look at it, third, there is a technological revolution. We see great achievements and accomplishments in AI, power generation, communication, genetics, bioengineering, medicine, and they open up colossal information. But they also raise applied issues, spiritual, philosophical, moral, which uh, only sci-fi writers were concerned in the past. When the technology will become better at thinking than human being, uh, to what extent can we interfere into the human organism before humanity ceases to be themselves and turn into something else? What are the ethical boundaries in the world where science and technology have no bounds? And what will it entail for our successors and descendants, our children and grandchildren? And these changes are gaining momentum. And they're impossible to stop because this is an objective reality and we'll have to respond to these changes. And all will have to do that regardless of your political regime, economic state, or prevailing ideology. Well, as far as words go, all countries say that they are committed to the ideals of cooperation, of working together uh, against common issues, but that is just what the words say. In reality, something else happens. And as I said, the pandemic has all but pushed forth and spurred on negative trends that came to the foreground a lot, uh, a long time ago. Everyone is out for themselves, and this is a principle that has become the new norm, and some even boast of that, and selfish interests have prevailed over the common good. And this is not about the ill will of elites or some countries. Everything is far more complex and complicated. The world is not black and white. Every government, every leader are first and foremost accountable to their compatriots, their citizens. They need to ensure their security, safety, and welfare. That is why international transboundary themes will never have the same importance for the leadership of a country uh, that internal stability has, and this is normal. This is the right thing to do, and we have to admit that world governance institutions are never as efficient as they need to be. They're not up to the task as far as the dynamics of global processes goes. And the pandemic has been a, help, a huge help in that because it showed what institutions have potential and what needs a readjustment. And Right now, we are up for a realignment of the world system because the shares will have to be redistributed between growing, developing countries that felt left aside in the past. And right now, 
it's no longer the West that is dominated in the world affairs right now. It was but a short period of time right now. Everything is uh, far more diverse and diversified. We see a transformation. It's not mechanical. It's a unique process. And the political history has not known any examples when a stable world order emerged without a big war not based on its outcomes, as it happened after the Second World War. So we have a chance to create a very good, benignant precedent, because we know that this attempt after the end of the Cold War, based on the West's domination, failed. And the current world order is a byproduct of that failure, and we have to learn the lesson. So what is the outcome we have arrived at? For two decades, the most powerful country in the world was engaged in military campaigns in two countries that were incomparable to it under any parameter. As a result, the country had to wind down its operation without achieving the objectives that it set forth 20 years ago. They had to withdraw from these countries, suffering and having dealt an important damage to others too. And the situation has worsened drastically. But it's not just about that. In the past, when a war was lost by one country, the other emerged victorious. And this victorious power assumed the responsibility. So the failure of the US in Vietnam did not lead to Vietnam turning into a black hole. No. We saw a statehood emerge in Vietnam. It was relying on the support of a powerful ally. But right now, everything is different. Whoever is on top, the war never ceases. It only changes its form. And the alleged victor either doesn't want or simply cannot ensure peace building, peace rehabilitation. It only exacerbates the chaos and leaves vacuum that is very dangerous. Colleagues, what are the starting points for this complicated process for the world realignment? Let me just succinctly share these thoughts with you. First, the coronavirus pandemic has showed that only a state can act as an element that gives structure to the world order. And the recent developments have shown that the attempts of global digital platforms, however powerful they are, we, we see testimonies to that. So these attempts to usurp political or state functions have failed. These are nothing but ephemeral attempts. And even the US has shown the place to the masters of these digital platforms, and the same is happening in Europe. If you look at the fines against these companies, if you see the measures undertaken to demonopolize the market, you know about that. Over the last decades, many have been putting forth loud concepts, proclaiming the outdatedness of the role of states. It was said that amid globalization, national boundaries became an anachronism, whereas a sovereignty was a barrier to prosperity. But you know, I said that, and I would like to say that once again. It was said by those who relied on their competitive edges and wanted to open up borders of our countries. But when it turns out that there are others who can be more successful, these forces get back to shutting down their borders and closing them off to others. They are building walls. Don't we see that? Everyone says that, and everyone understands what's happening perfectly. And there is you know, no point in contesting that fact. It's evident. But when there was talk about the need to open up the borders. We saw that the development took a different turn because only a sovereign state can efficiently respond to the challenges of time and to the requests of its citizens. And that is why a working international order has to take into account the interests and opportunities and capabilities of countries. 
uh, instead of trying to say that it should not be the case. And of course, no one should try to obtrude anything on others, be that principles of social and political regime or values that are proclaimed as universals. Because when we see a true crisis, then the only one, there is only one universal value, and that is the value of human life. And how do you protect that? Every state gives a response of its own based on its capabilities, culture, and tradition. And let me say a couple of words about the danger and the magnitude of the pandemic. As we know, the pandemic has claimed so far the lives of more than 4 million and 900,000 people. These are terrible figures that are superior to military losses of the countries that participated in the, sec in the First World War. Another thing I would like to say is that the magnitude of changes uh, is requiring that we all should be cautious, at least out of self-preservation, because quality shifts in technology, drastic changes in the environment, the overturning of the traditional regime do not mean that society and state have to respond in a drastic manner. We know in Russia all too well from experience, unfortunately, multiple experiences, that it's easier to destroy than to build. A little more than 100 years ago, Russia was undergoing through difficult times because of the First World War, but these problems were not bigger than those other countries were experiencing. Maybe those problems were not as acute as in other countries. And Russia was capable of overcoming these problems. But unfortunately, the revolutionary changes led to a collapse, to a disintegration of a big country. And the same story happened 30 years ago when a potentially powerful power did not embark on the path of necessary flexible transformations that were required as a result. It fell victim to dogmatic dogmatists of different kinds, reactionaries and progressionists. Everyone did their part. And this gives us a grounds to say that revolution is not a way out of a crisis. On the contrary, revolution only exacerbates crises. Not a single revolution was ever worth, worth the loss that it dealt, the, the blow, the damage that it dealt to human potential. Now the world is becoming very fragile and we need a pillar, a foundation, moral, ethical, value foundation. And values are a byproduct of cultural and historical development of every country, of every nation. And this intertwining of nations enriches those values, allows us a chance to look uh, at a different angle at our own tradition. But this process has to be organic. It should never be rapid because everything that is alien will be dismissed and abruptly any attempts at a valid diktat can create the result that is adverse to the desirable one. We see with bemusement the processes unfolding in countries that have grown accustomed to viewing themselves as the flagships of progress. Of course, it's none of our business what is happening. The social and cultural shocks that are happening in some countries, in the Western countries, some believe that aggressive blotting out of whole pages of your own history, the affirmative action in the interest of minorities and the requirement to renounce the traditional interpretation of such basic values as mother, father, family, and the distinction between sexes are a milestone towards a renewal of society. It's their right. They can do that if they want to. We're not trying to meddle into that. But we have a different point of view. We believe, at least the overwhelming majority of Russian society, that should be more precise, believe that we need to rely on our own spiritual values, on our historical traditions, on the culture of our multi-ethnic nation. The proponents of the so-called social progress believe that they are bringing a new conscience, uh, a new consciousness to humanity, something that is more correct. But we're not the ones to judge. Let them do that if they want to. But there is one thing I would like to say. The recipes they come up with are nothing new. 
paradoxical as it may seem, but this is something we saw in Russia. It happened in our country before. After the 1917 revolution, the Bolsheviks followed the dogmas of Marx and Engels, and they also declared that they were going to change the traditional lifestyle, the political, the economic lifestyle, as well as the very notion of morality, the basic principles for a healthy society. They were trying to destroy age and century-long values, revisiting the relationship between people. They were encouraging, informing on one's own beloved and families. It was hailed as the march of progress. And it was very popular across the world. And it was supported by many, as we see it is happening right now. Incidentally, the Bolsheviks were absolutely intolerant of other opinions, different from their own. And I think this should remind you of something that is happening. And we see what is happening in the Western countries. It is with puzzlement that we see the practices Russia used to have and that we left behind in distant path. The fight for equality and against discrimination turns into an aggressive dogmatism. Uh, on the brink of absurdity when great authors of the past, such as fake Shakespeare, are no longer taught in schools and universities because they are announced as backward classics that did not understand the importance of gender or race. In Hollywood, there are leaflets reminding what you should do in the cinema, in the films, how many personalities and actors you've got, well, what kind of color, what sex, and sometimes it's even even tighter and stricter than what the Department of Propaganda of the Soviet Communist Party Central Committee did. And the fight against racism, which is a lofty goal, turns into a new culture, uh, council culture, and into reverse discrimination, racism on the obverse. And it brings people apart, whereas the true fighters for civic rights, they were trying to eliminate those differences. I asked my colleagues to fight this quote from Martin Luther King, and he said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That is a true value. But I'm afraid this is not what we see in reality right now. Incidentally, in Russia, most of our countries simply do not care what skin color you have. He or she, that's not that important, because each and every one of us is a human person, human being. That's the most important thing. We see a phantasmagoria brought about by this discussion in the Western countries about the rights of men and women. You know, uh, the Bolsheviks were speaking about nationalizing not just the property, but also women. The proponents of new approaches go so far as they want to eliminate the whole notions of men and women. And those who dare say that men and women exist, and this is a biological fact, they are all but banished. Uh, parent number one, parent number two, or the uh, parent that has given birth, or instead of breast milk, you say human milk. And you say all of that so that people who are not sure of their sex or gender are not unhappy. And I would like to say that this is not something new. In the 20s, in the 1920s, the Soviet Kulturträger came up with the so-called Newspeak. And they thought that thereby they were building a new consciousness and coming up with new values. And they went so far that we feel the consequences up until now. There are some monstrous things when, from a very young age, you teach to children that a boy can easily become a girl. And you impose on them this selection, this choice. You push the parents aside and make the child take these decisions that can 
destroy their lives. And if we call the spade a spade, this is uh, nigh to a crime against humanity. And all of that under the banner of progress. Well, some people just want to do that. In the past, I said that when formulating our approaches, we will be guided by the ideology of healthy conservatism. As it happened several years ago, when the situation and the world arena was not as tense as it is right now, but the clouds were already on the horizon. And right now, the world is undergoing through a structural shifts. And right now, this healthy, sensible conservatism as a political cause has become an increasingly important, especially amid the growing number of risks and dangers and the fragility of reality around us. The conservative approach is not reactionary. It's not fear of any change. It's not trying to re preserve the status quo. It's about relying on time-tested tradition, on uh, preserving and multiplying our legacy, our, our heirloom, and also realism in assessing yourself and others. This is about an accurate system of priorities, understanding what's necessary and what's possible. It's about rejection of extremism as a method of work. And we do not know when this world realignment will end. And until it ends, until the world realigns, we have to stick to this conservatism. Because we have to remember this medical principle, do no harm, noli nocere, as it goes in Latin. And we believe this is the most sensible choice so far. And I would like to say that for Russia, these are not just theoretical constructs. These are lessons that we learned from our tragic history. We know that the price of social experimentation sometimes is too high. It's exorbitant. This social experiment can destroy material and spiritual pillars of human existence, leaving nothing but moral ruins that can give ground to uh, no new construction. And last but not least, without a close international cooperation, it's impossible to address the most acute problems. And we've got to be realists. We know that most beautiful slogans about the global solution to global issues that we've listened to since the 20th century, they will never come to pass because such global solutions require such a big transfer of sovereign rights of states and nations to supranational structures that I do not think anyone is willing to go that far. And besides, politicians are accountable not to global community, which is a very vague concept, but to their citizens, to their voters. But this does not mean that we cannot somewhat limit ourselves to give a global response to universal challenges, because a global challenge is a challenge to everyone and to all at once. And of course, if everyone sees that they will benefit from cooperation in working together to overcome these challenges, everyone is going to be willing to do that and to stimulate that we could probably come up with a roster of challenges and dangers under the UN auspices for concrete countries and for potential consequences. And we need to engage experts from different countries and from different scientific disciplines to participate in this process in this drafting. And you, in particular, distinguished colleagues, we believe that such a roadmap could encourage many countries to have a new look at world problems and to see what kind of benefit they stand to get from this cooperation. I mentioned the issues of international institutions. Unfortunately, this fact is becoming increasingly obvious. A reform or abolishment of a number of these organizations are on the agenda, but the most important institution is the UN, and it still remains a peremptory value. I believe that amid the turbulence of today's world, the UN is the carrier of this healthy conservatism in international relations that we need to normalize the situation. The organization is often criticized because it is not fast enough to adapt to uh, ever-changing circumstances. 
Well, it's justified to an extent, but the blame is not on the organization itself, but also on its participants. This is an international structure that carries norms and the very spirit of norm production. It's based on equality. It takes into account the opinion of each and everyone, and we need to create and preserve this heritage. Yes, we've got to reform the organization, but we should not throw away the baby out with the bathwater. And on many occasions, I spoke from a high podium and from Valdai too, because Valdai is a very authoritative platform, colleagues. We have to recognize that. And I spoke many times. And the problems are piling up. They become increasingly explosive. So we need to work together. So once again, I would like to take this opportunity to say that we are willing, we are ready to work together to address the most acute common issues. Distinguished colleagues, the changes that we've spoken today and uh, that we discussed before this plenary session concern all nations, all peoples, and Russia is no exception. Just as the rest of us, we are searching for a response, a solution to the most acute challenges of today. And there are no ready-made recipes. But I'll go as far as to say that our country has a competitive edge. And that competitive edge consists in our historic experience. And I spoke about that on many occasions throughout my today's remarks. And I had to remind you of many negative lessons that we learned in the past. But our country has come up with a collective immunity to extremism that leads to shocks, social and political collapses. People highly value stability as well as a chance to develop steadily. They like this confidence that their plans, their hopes will not come down crashing because of careless aspirations of a new batch of revolutionaries. We still remember all too well what happened three decades ago and how long it took us to climb out of this hole that we found ourselves in after the dissolution of the USSR. And our conservatism is that of optimists. And we believe that a steady, stable development is possible. But of course, it's, uh, uh, it comes down to us, to our own efforts. And we are willing to work with our partners for these lofty ideas. I would like to thank all the participants once again. And as is tradition, I will be glad to take your questions. Well, I'll try to answer your questions. Thank you.